What's up, y'all? Welcome to another episode of the Two Man Game. I'm Cone. We've got Ryan here. Big news to go ahead and start off this show. But first, leave a like and subscribe if you're here on YouTube, if you're on Spotify or any other platform. Make sure to go ahead, write five stars, download the episode, come over to YouTube, like and subscribe, all that stuff to go ahead and help us out. Ryan is currently going through some stuff over there if you're watching on a video platform because James Harden, savior of his Philadelphia 76ers, has finally been traded. I real quick want to go ahead and break down how it happened for me in real time. And then I'll let Ryan go ahead and give his side of the story. So when the trade goes down at like 2.30 ish AM in the morning, I'm still awake. I'm trying to plan stuff for a video for tomorrow. I'm just getting some things in line, but I'm like, okay, I'm going to go to bed here soon so I can wake up decently early the next morning. And then boom, James Harden is traded according to Woj. We get the tweet and we're going to break down the whole trade throughout this video, as well as giving you a quick overreaction, or I guess just a takeaway from every team's first week in the league. But I get the react or I get the notification. And my first thought is, should I call Ryan to wake him up or text him or something? But I'm like, he's got work in the morning. He'll find out soon enough on his own. So I go ahead and, you know, start to make a thumbnail for a video to put out there on YouTube. But we don't figure out the details for like 45 minutes. Woj like falls asleep or something or just we thought he might have tweeted it in his sleep and just didn't know what the details were. So everyone's staying up like I'm trying to make a video. People are freaking out on Twitter like what's the package because we had no idea what it was. Was it going to be Terrence Mann? Was it going to be Norman Powell? Was it going to be role players picks? We had no idea. And finally, the package comes through. Like I said, we'll talk about that in a moment, but I go ahead and stay up to record my video. And I was up till ungodly hours in the morning, up so early, or I guess later, whatever you want to say, that Ryan woke up and I got a notification and he tweeted, uh, what, what was the tweet that you put out? Like when you figured it out? I said that was certainly something to wake up to. Yeah, which makes sense. And then him and I texted about it a little bit. I put out a video in the morning um, before I went to bed, again, at a ridiculous hour of the morning, night, whatever you want to say. But yeah, that was kind of my experience. It was stunning. This is not the first time the Clippers have shocked the world with a blockbuster deal like two in the morning. They, of course, did the same thing with the Shea Paul George trade. They seem to be. Tobias Harris. Yeah, that deal also went down late as hell. I don't know why they love to do this all the time, but. Seems to be something they just like to do, but Daryl Morey gets the deal done, seems James, sends James Harden over to the Clippers. Ryan, how did you figure out about it? So I went to bed, you know, like a normal human being, kind of late actually, because I just got back from a vacation with some buddies and my sleep schedule is really thrown off. When you're staying up uh, at a casino pretty late, it's and all the flashing lights and stuff, it definitely messes up your sleep cycle. But I headed to bed at like, eh, like 11.30, and then I woke up at 4.30, just like I naturally woke up, and I placed a couple bets on like the Lakers Magic game. So I went to check my phone to see if any of them hit. And I don't see like a trade or anything pop up. I just see Clippers sending unprotected first to Philly. And I'm like, wow, I wonder, <laughs> I wonder what that's for. <laughs> yeah, I wonder, wonder what that has to do with. So then I pull up Twitter, and obviously I see everything. And I just see everyone that was freaking out about it. And I was like, dang, I fell asleep. For, and it was asleep for like two hours after the trade happened. And so I didn't have to sit up and wait for, cause I would have been, that's the thing. If it happened at like 1130 when I was supposed to go to bed and I had to wait like 45 minutes for that to happen, that would have been terrible. That would have been so, <laughs> that would have been such torture. Yeah, but I mean, was... I ended up not being able to go back to bed. Cause I was so like distraught and like confused and like, what the heck? I thought I was dreaming for a couple minutes there. I had a double take. Yeah. But, I kind yeah, of woke uh, up in a daze. I saw I'm glad I didn't call you and wake you up. I thought about it yeah. for a moment, but I was like, nah. My phone was on silent, bro. You wouldn't have woke me up. Oh, okay. There we I go. Was, I don't have vibrate on or anything. Okay. So, but yeah, dude, I was just pretty shook about it. And then I couldn't go back to bed. And then I wake, I usually wake up for work at like six o'clock. So I just was up for like an hour and a half after that and <laughs> lived my day. And here I am up late again before work talking about it now. So I, there's yeah. a little bit of a pattern here, but We'll talk about yeah. opinions and stuff later, but I was just so shook to the core about it. I just could not believe it. It was like, it, I think you and I both were pretty convinced Harden was at least going to suit up for Philly before a trade happened. Yeah, I didn't think he was going to be traded before playing a single game. I thought, I mean, he was, I guess maybe it's because he knew he was leaving, but he was out there laughing with the like, other guys on the Sixers bench, like getting involved. It seemed like he was ready to come back at some point soon and didn't end up being the case. I don't know if he thought he was getting traded or knew he was getting traded. Him and PJ Tucker were like laughing and talking with each other. Maybe they knew something because obviously PJ Tucker's involved in this deal as well. So let's go ahead actually and talk about what the package looks like. And then we can go ahead and get into our opinions. So we have the 
Uh, trade package up here on the screen again if you're a video watcher. Uh, the Sixers acquired Marcus Morris, Nick Batum, Robert Covington, KJ Martin, and multiple draft picks, which we found out were a 2028 pick from the Clippers, a 2029 pick swap, and a 2026 pick from the uh, Thunder. That's the worst of one of the, I think it's the worst of the Thunder, Clippers, and Miami picks in 2026. And the Thunder in exchange for adding into this deal, putting another first and for the Sixers to go ahead and get this thing done, get a 2027 pick swap from the Clippers. So banking on the Clippers being potentially worse than them in 2027 because they've gone completely all in for these next few years with a really old core at this point of guys that are definitely somewhat injury prone each. But in return for all that, uh, the Clippers end up getting James Harden, PJ Tucker, and Philip Petrusev. It's a big-time deal. Again, the Clippers get the guy they've been looking for in James Harden, and the Sixers finally wash their hands of this whole situation. Ryan, I'll let you go first. I'll let you go ahead and talk a bit about James Harden, You know how you feel about what you got back here. I made a full video talking about my thoughts, and I'll reiterate those, of course, here on the pod. But I'll give you the chance to go first, being the Sixers fan, you know, having to go through this whole saga the second time you've now had to trade a star point guard over the past few years. How are you feeling about Philly at this point? Well, the good thing is we have another star point guard in the wings. So it's yeah, it seems like you do. We'll see how long before he requests out. So yeah, and uh, I think I think Tyrese, <laughs> I think the emergence of Maxi as you know, he's not going to sustain thirty points per game, but I think it's really legitimate that he's going to average you know upper twenties this year. And the thing mm -hmm. is, he's a great shooter. And it's funny because watching him play, he like definitely picked up so much from Harden. Just like so many step back threes and like just crazy shots that like we would have seen Houston James Harden, you know, making his sleep max. He's, you know, imitating. So I think that's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it sucks to see a star player like Harden go, even if he kind of was all over the place with Philly and then not get a star back. But I think the fact that the team has looked really good, like they're two and one. And even the game that they lost against the Bucks, I mean. It's a really team good look. Bucks team, and it was really close. In the it was again, a really good game. I mean, I'm not yeah, trying to pull the ref card, but I mean that uh, no call on the Giannis uh, alley oop or whatever the frick that was supposed to be, where they said he just lost control. Like, okay, buddy, whatever. And then passing out for Dame to hit a three, freaking huge, like a five point swing there, basically. But mm -hmm. anyways, I think the team looking really good, and the team's playing good under Nurse. Like, it just looked like they have this new energy and. Now the roster is probably this is probably the most deep roster the Sixers I think have had in the Embiid era. Not necessarily the most like star heavy, but definitely like depth wise, it looks really good. And it's really just going to be like Maxi and Harden balling out, and then like hella wings around them <laughs> just going crazy. So they have a lot of options. Um, I think Batum and Covington are definitely going to play good roles. I don't know what they're going to do with Marcus Morris because he's just been kind of like he's been. He was he's really bad, bad last year. He hasn't played for the Clippers at all this year. Like, I don't really know. I could see point. him just kind of chilling on the bench because I think he's just a worse version of Ubre at this point. I think they're kind of redundant players, you know, score first wings that are, I don't know, not nothing on defense. But I would probably take Ubre with the way he's been playing over Morris. Ubre's been great, yeah. So, and then KJ Martin, I think, is really interesting too. I think not a lot of people are talking about it. Like, a lot of Rockets fans were really peeved when they had to trade him. Mm -hmm. uh, what deal was he a part of? Do you remember off the top of your head? He was, I think he was part of moving salary to bring in. I think I think he was part of moving salary to like bring in Fred Van Vliet or Dylan Brooks or something like that. I think he was part of one of those salary type of moves. I thought he played for the Clippers last year, though. Let me look real quick. But um, I, but anyways, while I look this up, I just I think he's a really underrated piece. He's I think 22 years old, and he I remember watching him a lot with the Rockets, and I always thought he was a pretty solid player. And I know a lot of Rockets fans were kind of salty that he got traded. It was just kind of like we have all these players, so you're kind of on the outside looking in. Mm -hmm. um, let me yeah, see, I'm pulling up his basketball reference page right now. But I mean, he's a he shot pretty good from three a year ago. He's athletic. He's um, we don't really have like a young athletic wing. You know, we had you know Jalen McDaniels last year who's now putting up what connor sent me the worst stat line probably in existence yeah he's been rough with the raptors he's putting up zero points per game it's about like 42 minutes so far not a great showing from yeah. him up well, to it looks point. like yeah it looks like he was he, martin was part of that giant sign and trade that let them get um dylan brooks so yeah yeah I, that's what i thought i thought he was involved i remember a lot of rockets fans were kind of uh, kind of salty about that yeah, I know there was there was some reports and rumors that he wanted out, that he wanted some kind of bigger role beyond what Houston was giving him at that point. He hasn't gotten it so far. I mean, he's been dealt 
now multiple times over the course of his young career. But I do think he's an underrated piece for the Sixers. Like, again, like you said, a young athletic wing. He's got some potential there. Worst case, he doesn't work out. But it's a young guy you can take a chance on. And he's shown some great flashes at times. Really, for me, what this deal provides the Sixers is flexibility. To me, this is the big reason I like this deal a lot for Philly. They've really been prioritizing this idea of keeping themselves financially flexible going forward. They didn't sign Maxi to a big extension like they could have this offseason. They said, instead, we're going to wait till the offseason following, which seems like it might end up costing them more money if Maxi keeps playing the way that he has so far, uh, you know, putting up 30 points per game, just one Eastern Conference player of the week for the first week. Huge shout out to Maxi. A lot of people thought he could break out into an all-star this season. Seems like that's probably going to be the case if he continues playing this way. But they didn't give him that extension. And now every contract that they picked up Batum, Morris, uh, Covington, Kenya Martin, all of them are expiring. And if you take a look at the Sixers payroll, the only guys on the roster going into next year at this point are Embiid, Paul Reed, whose money is unguaranteed, and Jaden Springer, who has a $4 million team option that I think they've already picked up, if I remember correctly. They've got like no money on the books. So there's a couple of ways they can go with this. The first one is all throughout the season, now that they've picked up these pieces, they have a whole year or up until the deadline to evaluate what this team needs and look out there and see if a star becomes available, if there's a disgruntled guy out there, the Sixers are probably going to be at the front of the line trying to pick up that player because now they have these expiring salaries that a team like, say, for example, Chicago, they're the first team that comes to mind with me. Uh, we're going to talk about them later as a team that we both agree needs to go ahead and blow it up. I think everybody agrees at this point that... <clears throat> The Bulls need to go ahead and trade away Levine and DeRozan. And Woj put out an article about the deal last night. And he said that one of the primary reasons they made this deal in particular was so they had the possibility of adding another star guard next to Maxine and Bede. And to me, if you talk about star guards that could become available, Zach Levine seems to be that player. But even beyond him, some other guys like... Pascal Siakam. I think he could be an interesting piece as an expiring player at this moment where either you could go out and trade for him now or you could even wait till free agency because, again, they're going to have two max contract spots. One of them will probably be filled by Maxi. But if they do some maneuvering, they could get a lot of good pieces. Or if they don't even go out and get a star, they could just add a number of really solid role players. So the Sixers, the Sixers have given themselves a lot of flexibility, in my opinion. And I think that's huge for them. It makes the most sense to keep yourself flexible because you don't know what Maxi is going to turn into this season. You don't know what stars could become available. So keep your options open. You've got picks now that you can flip. You've got expiring contracts. I think, you know, specifically Covington can play a decent role for this team. Batum has been pretty bad to start this year, but I think he's a fine piece and, you know, not that many minutes. We'll probably give you something similar to PJ Tucker out there um, at this point. Not as much defense, of course, but maybe a little bit more offensively. He just provides a little bit of value. Like you said, you add some depth to this team. You let Max and Embiid cook, and you kind of just see what happens. I think they're enough to keep you afloat until the deadline or until someone becomes available. And when that does become the case, I expect more to be aggressive. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Sixers land another star player for these two guys throughout the season, which could ultimately be exactly what they need. I like all of the players we talked about, Siakam, Levine, um, I know there's DeMar DeRozan out there. I don't like him as much as a fit being an older player. Even and... our rental, you know, if they wanted to just kind of like go in, like if we, if we just traded, you know, scraps. And yeah. You contracts. just, you kind of flip the, flip the salaries and then maybe go for a different free agent in the off season. I could see that being the case if they wanted to go that route. Uh, but yeah, I think the Sixers did a really good job. People are going to clown on this trade and have been because they didn't get a star player back. They didn't get like Terrence Mann who they wanted, but I think this was one of the better packages they were going to get, especially when Harden is on the last year of his deal. They had no leverage because he publicly requested a trade and said that the Clippers were the only spot he wanted to be. And it seems like the Clippers were the only team that was interested. So all in all, I think the Sixers did a pretty good job with this deal. And I agree. I just think people that are clowning it don't really have the perspective that it's like you're trading an expiring deal. Like think about other expiring players that have been dealt in the past. Like how many expiring players have gotten you two first round picks, a pick swap, a second round? Didn't the Sixers get a second also? Two seconds. Two seconds, and then like three players that you know improve your your, your roster. Like I just don't really feel like that deal really comes around that much. Like we, yeah. we, we might have to go compare it to because you know this is kind of a niche case. But I don't like off the top of my head, I can't think of the last expiring like star like that. They got such a haul. Yeah, it. 
I mean, there, there have been some expiring stars that have gotten a good bit because, I mean, they like agreed on a contract extension immediately, yeah. but that was like a, that's usually like a star for star kind of deal. But aren't Paul like George we, and Kawhi for agents this year too, technically? We will talk about that with the Clippers. We can go ahead and move into the Clippers, I guess, with that. Um, yeah, the Clippers, I mean, if they were all in in the first place, they are even more all in now making this trade because Harden's a free agent. Paul George and Kawhi both have team op or not team options, player options, which I expect they'll decline at the very least. They might resound with the Clippers, but all three of their top players could test free agency. And they started the season really hot. They looked great to begin the year. Russ was playing well outside of that Utah game, that game winner attempt that he airballed and made Kawhi Leonard fall to his knees. We won't have we won't talk <laughs> That's about a that. That's a hilarious clip, dude. We won't talk about that. Uh did you see oh, Paul George's about. Halloween costume thing today? Uh, I saw it was where's Waldo and the Clippers tweet out where's Paul and, and you, I saw your tweet about having like all those bookmarks for when it's got it had like 5,000 bookmarks in an hour because if he has a bad playoff series that where's Waldo picture of Paul George asking where he's at is going to be all over the timeline he has oh, set yeah. himself up for unbelievable slander in the playoffs if he struggles mm -hmm. so keep an eye on that but yeah Paul George has been looking amazing so far. Seems like he might be in for an all-star, even all-NBA type of season. Kawhi's looked good. Russ has been good. Bones Highland's been cooking off the bench. Like This Clippers team has felt amazing to start the year, and now they're adding James Harden to the fold, who I think helps this team. They've been looking for a consistent playmaker. Russ has provided a bit of that role, but Harden led the league in assists last year. I think he's going to help them out a lot. Takes off some of the scoring burden of Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, especially now you've got someone, another star who you can lean on. If, say, Kawhi misses a couple of weeks for a random injury here and there, Paul George does the same, even if Harden does the same. Now you've got these three all-stars who you can rotate in and out of the rotation if you need to, rest some other guys, and they could still get wins. They can still build some chemistry. If you get to the playoffs and you have a similar situation, like, hey, Paul George isn't going to be ready for this first series. If you've got a good matchup, maybe you could still get through with Kawhi and James Harden alongside Russell Westbrook. They didn't have to lose Terrence Mann Terrence or Norman Man. Powell all-star Terrence Mann, who everybody apparently thinks is way younger than he is. I've learned over the course of these past few months. I think he just turned 27 or something like that. So yeah, I mean, he's a really good player, but he's not this young asset that I feel like people for some reason think that he is. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think the Clippers certainly got better with this deal. To me, they're, they're not better than the Nuggets. I think I'd probably still have them below a healthy Suns team, but I probably have them as like my third squad out there in the Western Conference right now. The Lakers are also interesting. We'll talk about the Lakers later, who haven't looked great so far. But I like this a lot for the Clippers. It is definitely risky, though, with the free agency possibility, with the fact that Harden is super unpredictable. This is now his fourth team since 2021, which feels ridiculous to even say that that's the case. It He's been really hit or miss. And maybe this is finally where he stops. Maybe this is where he chills. But we've thought that might be the case in Brooklyn. We thought that might be in the case in Philly. And... I guess we'll see here. I mean, I thought it was the case in Houston. It felt like Harden might be a, a Rockets lifer after starting his career with the Thunder. I will, I guess we'll have to see. We thought now, he was going back until uh, Ime Adoga said, no, nah, we're good. Yeah, we thought, we thought Harden was going back. Ime Adoga said, no, thanks. No, you're not coming back. It's been a really tumultuous portion of Harden's career. So we'll have to see what he's able to do mm -hmm. in this new scenario. I like the fit. I think he's going to be good. But yeah, I do worry about him being volatile. I worry even if they do have guys who can pick up for each other with injuries, they are all injury prone. So yeah, man, I don't know. It's I, I like this trade for the Clippers. I think they got better, mm -hmm. but it is definitely risky. Like if their chips weren't all pushed in already, this is as far in as this franchise could possibly go. Yeah, man. It's just like, and they kind of nuked their depth. They nuked their assets. It's just like, like you said, there's just like no turning back. It's just, I feel like anything less than a Western Conference Finals run, like even then that, that might be considered a pretty big failure. But I think anything less, like a first or second round exit is an absolute like atrocious failure. Like, yeah, I they, think they need it. I mean, at this point with how much they put into this thing, probably anything less than a, like if they don't make a finals appearance or like win a finals, it's somewhat of a disappointment with how far they've gone in on this. I don't, but I mean, I'm not saying that from my perspective, like I think that the nuggets are the better team. I think that we'll talk about them again later. We'll talk about every team in this video, but the nuggets have been the best team in the league so far, just mainly in the Western conference, but in my opinion, the best team in the league so far, the uh, Suns have looked, have held up a little bit, although Booker and, Bradley Beal already dealing with some injuries. So the West isn't completely closed off. Like they could win it, I would say. I think they're championship contenders with this move. 
but it's going to be hard. Like there's a lot of great teams in the Western Conference and, you know, they still deal with injury issues with how much they put into this thing. Yeah. I mean, at this point, anything less than achieving a finals berth for the first time in Clippers history or winning a finals with this group is probably somewhat of a failure. And you run the risk of if they lose in the second round again, what's to stop Kawhi from leaving Paul George from saying, I want to go somewhere else. And even if they run this thing back, they're all getting older. They're somewhat injury prone. It's concerning. This might be like their last hurrah here in this moment. I think too, one thing you have to talk about as well is just that like these three headed monsters that the, these teams have been trying to make really haven't been working out. We could talk about Brooklyn with Kyrie and KD and Harden, the Lakers attempting it with LeBron Westbrook and um, AD it's just like, I feel like we haven't really seen that three headed monster type of team win it all yet. You know what I mean? I feel like all of these past couple of finals winners have all been like two really good players and like a really good supporting cast. So, yeah. And it's like, it's, it's the nuggets who won it first. They've got their, the best player in the world, Nikola Jokic, all-star caliber guy in Jamal Murray, and then some really good role players around them. You've got the, Uh, Golden State Warriors, who've been doing it for a while with Steph Curry, superstar, all-star caliber guys, or like Andrew Wiggins was an all-star. Clay wasn't really at that level anymore, but they had some really solid role players. Draymond Green, still one of the best defenders in the league. You had the Milwaukee Bucks with Giannis. Again, main superstar, all-star guys next to him and Drew and Chris. Like, we, you're right. We haven't really seen this Frankenstein together three-man or three-headed monster, like you were saying, this big three type of team. Win in a long time. I think the last time that it worked probably was K- the Miami Katie, Heat. Katie, well, K- I mean, Katie, Steph, and Clay in theory. Yeah, I guess in theory. But even then, like they still had, they still had Steph, Clay, Drummond. Like they were all there first. They didn't assemble this team. Like yeah, it's, it's these- not like they took three players, really good players, and said, "Let's super team it up." Yeah, I think the last time that this has worked is probably the big three Heat with LeBron, Wade, and Bosh. Yep. Um, which I guess is kind of a similar situation in terms of having like one star already there with, I guess, like kind of what the Suns are trying to do, where you've got like a Wade that stays there. You've got a Devin Booker that stays there. You add uh, Kevin Durant and Bradley Beal in that situation. Other to, side, of course, it's um, LeBron and Bosh. Yeah. But yeah, we haven't really seen that work out so far. And maybe we're reaching an era where it just doesn't work as much. And a big reason for that has been injuries. Like, it's funny how... Harden is again being involved in one of these teams where it feels like injuries are one of the main things that could derail them with the nets. It feels like they probably would have won a ring if their team didn't completely fall apart because of injuries, you know, Harden ends up messing up his hamstring. Kyrie messes up his ankle. The nets are still able to force the bucks to game seven before they lose. They might've won a ring with this. I mean, the Clippers feel like they could have had a shot in 2021 against, they went up against the Phoenix Suns and they pushed them to six games without Kawhi Leonard. If Kawhi plays, maybe we're talking about this Clippers team way differently where they made the NBA finals at the very least. Maybe they beat the Bucks. Maybe they're NBA champions. We really don't know. And that's been the case with the Clippers. They've gone continuously to these what ifs, this land at this point of what could have been if they stayed healthy. And part of me feels like that's the reason why they went for this hardened trade or why I, you know, even though they're mortgaging their entire future, even more than they did, maybe they had to do this because you have to do what you can. You've put so much into this. If you can add another star player in James Harden, where sure they looked great to start the year. And maybe that would have continued to be the case, but now you give yourself a full year to battle with James Harden and you've tried this thing over and over again, shake it up a little bit. I don't know. I've seen a lot of people really hate on this deal. I think a lot of people just don't like James Harden, which I guess is somewhat understandable from a uh, perspective of someone who's probably had him on his, on their team. Like, you know, him asking out, trying to move different scenarios. I don't have a problem with James Harden. No shout to him, Thunder legend, but it seems like people don't really like James Harden all that much. And I think that's clouding people's judgment a little bit on this team. So I'm very curious to see if just like, there's too much going on here. Like I feel like Westbrook and Harden interesting playing together, you know, there are some issues with them in Houston, whether their play styles kind of clashed a little bit. And of course they're both, I would say shells of their former selves in terms of their play right now. Mm-hmm. And then with Harden or not Harden, um, Kawhi and Paul George, it'll just be really interesting to see how their games mesh. Like I think on paper, it makes sense. You have two really good facilitating guards that can get their own if needed. And then two, like not three and D wings, but you know what I mean? Like they're good offensively and defensively. Like they, they play two way wings. Yeah. With and then with like a okay center and Zubots, that's like good enough to anchor the 
Yeah. The big man One worry player. I do have is Kawhi and PG aren't the defenders they used to be. So part mm-hmm. of me does worry a little bit about that defense because Russ really bought in in the playoffs in particular. He looked really good out there. So if they get that from him, could be fine. But Harden's not a great defender. Wasn't for majority of his career. Mm-hmm. Definitely isn't at this point. And Kawhi and PG, like I said, aren't as good as they used to be. Zubats has looked good defensively to start this season. So... I think they'll probably be fine, but that is something that I'm keeping a little bit of an eye on. And again, we'll have to see if they're able to build chemistry over the course of the year or if guys miss time all throughout the season like they did last year. But yeah, I mean, I like this for both sides. I think this is a deal that ended up working out. Both sides wanted to get this thing over with. They did. And now they can head their separate ways. Sixers banking on Maxi getting better, a lot of flexibility in terms of trying to pursue another star in the future. And the Clippers get their guy in James Harden, build their big three over there and look like one of the better teams in the West. So I've seen a lot of people kind of rushing to pick a loser. I don't really think either team lost in this scenario. It'll be very fun to watch this first game for the Clippers. I'm excited. I'll, I'm definitely going to have to watch. Oh, yeah. this It's it's going to be very interesting to see how that first game looks, how they look all out there. But, okay. Let's go ahead now and get into the main portion of this, which is going to be us giving a little bit about every single team in the NBA. It's been about a week since the season started. A week exactly. We're recording this on Halloween night. So we need to talk a little bit about every team. And we went ahead, wrote down a couple of notes here and there for each squad. Um, We might bring up some other stuff too, but we're going to go through this. Uh, Do you want to do alphabetically or reverse alphabetically? Let's do reverse. Let's do reverse. Okay. So we're starting at the bottom with the Washington Wizards. And we're going to keep this pretty quick, by the way. We're not going to talk about each team for five minutes, like one to two minutes probably about each yeah. team. So if you get mad, we don't mention your favorite player. You're like, oh, this dude's been pretty good. Why didn't you talk about him? It just wasn't our priority. <laughs> yeah. Let us know if there's any other storylines or players or things that you've noticed watching your team in the comments below. Like mm-hmm. Ryan said, we're not going to spend forever. Some teams will talk about a little bit longer than others just because that's the nature of things. Some teams just don't have that much to talk about at this point. Or other teams have just been so like, not to call anyone out, horrible. There's a, <laughs> there's just nothing that's say, to say other than that they've been really bad. Yeah. Well, speaking about one team who hasn't been great so far, but has been really fun, the Washington Wizards, who are maybe the NBA's funniest team out there, which I feel like most people could have predicted going into the season. It felt like they were going to be one of those f- like fun, young, but bad teams. It's been the case so far. They got eviscerated by the Celtics last game. They went out there with Gafford Hurt. They started Kyle Kuzma at the center spot, and Kristaps Porzingis made them look like children out there. Jalen Brown hit seven threes in the first half, and the game was over pretty much by the end of the first quarter. You had Jordy Poole dribble inside the three-point line on a fast break, turn around, dribble the ball back out, and then just immediately flip back around again and try and shoot a three just very casually. And Chris Stops blocked it, and I think they got a transition bucket off that too. Uh, it was against the it was against the Pacers or the Grizzlies where Jordan Poole did the turnaround thing. I think it was against the Grizzlies. He did the Steph Curry where he turned around to the bench and, t- and while the ball was still up in the air and then completely bricked the shot. Yeah, he tried to hit the Steph Curry turnaround three in the corner. Did not go in, which... You know, not a great look when you're trying to do that type of thing. It's been hilarious watching the Wizards so far. Uh, They've had some fun things. Bilal Kulabali looks amazing as a defender. Uh, Kispert's had a solid start to the season. I think it was against the Grizzlies in particular. He was really going off, which is funny. Kispert's one of those guys that I think needs to get traded to like a good team and that he can just play like a a three, three, three point shooter off the bench role. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think Kispert could be a really good role player, whether it's for the Wizards going forward or... I think really for any team, he feels like one of the more underrated, like young role player type of guys in the league. But there was there was one funny moment on the Wizards broadcast against the Grizzlies where they're going into halftime and their sideline reporter asks Corey Kispert basically like, what are you all doing defensive or what do you like? What's helping you be so good offensively? You just put up your career high points in a single half. And he starts talking and he's like, oh, you know, they're packing the paint. So I'm doing this and that. Like he starts getting to some of the details and then. Like, for some reason, the mic was broadcasting this over the entire stadium. And so, like, the Grizzlies are walking off the court, and she's asking him, like, hey, how are you getting all these open looks? Like, what are you doing offensively? Like, breaking down their strategy. And he quickly, like, looks up and realizes it's coming out of, like, the loudspeaker to all the fans. And then he, like, he starts giving the most vague answers ever. So he goes, like, you know, they're packing the paint. Like, I'm doing this and that. Looks up a little bit and then goes, like, but really, I'm just I'm just doing my thing. You know, I know what I'm comfortable with in my game, and I'm just going to continue to do that. And then she asked, like, what they're doing defensively. And he's like, 
you know, you know what we're capable of. Like we know what we're able to do. We're just playing our brand of defense, really buying in on that end, and you know, just just committing to the defensive end. And she's like, "All right, thank yeah. you, Corey, for your time." And he like looked back up again. So the Wizards were like trying to. <laughs> I don't know if this is an elite tank maneuver where they're going to start selling out their team's strategies during sideline interviews going into halftime. But there's someone in the background telling really Corey to keep going. <laughs> yeah, they've got like cue cards. Like read these. Tell the Grizzlies exactly what play we're going to run in the second half to open things up. That's funny. Yeah, I missed so, that. That's hilarious. Yeah, I know. I noticed that, and I was like, I hope more people saw that. But anyways, yeah, that's the Wizards. You got anything else you want to add? Bad team. We'll have some fun moments. That's pretty much going to be their season. Oh yeah, they're going to have so many funny highlights. Jordan Poole has been fantastic so far to watch him. Also, shout Tyus Jones. He's been good so far in that starting role. Okay, next team is the Utah Jazz. What do you got for the Utah Jazz? Pretty much all I really had there was just that Lori Markinen, at least as of now, is showing that last year wasn't a fluke and that he can still be like an all-star type of talent, which I think is pretty cool. I was one of those guys that was kind of a hater. Not a hater, but like like show me that you can do it again. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. he looks pretty good. So I still think they're not gonna be very good. I know Connor and I had that huge argument about <laughs> whether they're gonna be the twelfth or the fifteenth seed, but I still think they're gonna be pretty bad. But they'll have some cool moments, and I still think they're missing that like young go-to guy outside of Lori. So hopefully they're really bad and they can get a good draft pick and get that guy to put next to Lori and some of their other um, young talent. And then I also put on there that I think John Collins is like, he hasn't been great. Like the three point ball is still nowhere near where it should be, but he's, yeah, been, it's not he's at least been serviceable, which is kind of cool. Cause he was kind of unplayable at the end of his Hawks tenure. So that's kind of neat that he's at least a role player <laughs> at this yeah. point, not, no MVP, or whatever. What was it? The KD tweet or something like that back in the day? Yeah, it was the the tweet from the Hawks with oh. KD next to John Collins when KD was on the Warriors. And it said two, it said two MVPs with John Collins next to Kevin Durant. So something tells me he's not going to be winning an MVP at some point in his career. But yeah, yeah he's, he's looked solid. Uh, like you said, Lowry's been fantastic so far. They're struggling with guard play at the moment, trying to get consistent. Clarks, play from yeah, Clarkson guys. has looked pretty bad. Clarkson, they, they were just... That's really the next step for them is to figure out like who's the guard of the future. Yeah, Clarkson right now is playing up 12 points per game, shooting under 40% from the field, under 30%. What's grade. happening is they're trying to thrust him into this like lead guard role when he just needs to be a goon off the bench for somebody. You know, he needs to come off the bench and just chuck a bunch of stupid shots. He'll have a night where he goes nuclear. He shouldn't be a starting guard on like a team. You know what I mean? I think they need to get him out of town and let George just run some, let George Sexton and, uh, is Akabaji a guard technically? Yeah, he's he's like a he's like a two a two or three like. Can you see let those guys there. run the guard position and then just see what happens? Yeah, Clarkson. I could see if the Jazz end up being bad throughout the season, I could see Clarkson being a deadline candidate to be moved. We I talk about be, it every deadline though, so who knows? Yeah, that's true. I wouldn't be surprised, but yeah, I think figuring out that guard rotation is the next step for them. Haven't loved Taylor Horton Tucker in that role so far. Mm-hmm. So. That was the other guard I was missing. He's not been good. Like Keontae George, just go out there and hoop, if you ask me. Let him do it. I agree. Yeah, He hasn't been great so far, but I don't care. Let him do it. Let him cook. All right, next up we've got the Raptors. Uh, the offense sucks. It's well, that's really not what bad. you have written there. You have the offense is uh, explosive. The offense is really bad is basically it. It's been terrible to watch. They have this decent offensive like philosophy that they're trying to put into place. It doesn't work. They don't have the personnel to run it. Like – they just they can't knock down shots. There's no spacing for this team whatsoever. The bright spot has been Scotty Barnes. Barnes has been amazing. He feels like he could be an all-star this season. He's seemingly taking the jump that some people were expecting last year, and he's doing it now. He's really pushing himself into a star role. He's been their best player so far, but it hasn't resulted in a lot of success. They've been, like I said, terrible offensively. The defense doesn't look too bad, but they can't seem to score any buckets. Uh, there was some stat I saw where they have one of the worst half court offenses through again. It's just the beginning of the season. Keep that in mind for all these takes that we have, but yeah. through these first few games, they've got one of the worst half court offenses that we've seen in a really, really long time. It is awful out there. And at this pace, it feels like they're going to be probably bad again this year. And if that's the case, you know, maybe Siakam gets dealt, maybe on does, but Scotty Barnes has been really good. He deserves a shout out because a lot of people I think got really down on him last year, which was unfair. He was a second year player being asked to do a lot more, a lot more ball handling, playmaking as a forward. And he's doing that a lot better this year. It seems like those reps paid off. He's creating the shot better. He's been a lot more efficient than he's been over his past few seasons. 
it feels like Scotty Barnes might be taking that all-star leap. And that's huge for this team going forward because it will probably make the Raptors more confident in going ahead and resetting this thing with Scotty Barnes as that number one guy if he continues to show these flashes and plays as good as he has so far. Just one of those things where like the three best players on the team all play the same position. Like I know they're not all, but like just like Siakam Barnes, you know what I mean? Siakam Barnes and Andrew. They just, all. it's all just like forward, like front court type of guys. They don't really have that great like guard. Like they don't have a great lead guard. Schroeder hasn't filled it. Like it just feels like the offense is really lacking that high level playmaker, you know, some shot creating guards, just really any type of spacing whatsoever. They, they just don't have the juice offensively. And I don't think it's an issue that's going to fix over time. To me, it feels like it's just a personnel problem that will ultimately they need, they need to drag drop Obi down. and Siakam and just build around Scotty. I think so too. I think if they go ahead and just tank for the better part of this season, if they can, it's going to result in them because not many teams are tanking at this point. If the Raptors trade those guys sooner than later and just let Scotty run the show, see what he can do you know, maybe he gets an all-star appearance and you go ahead and start building around him and maybe another player we get in this year's draft. So yeah, offense has been bad. Uh, speaking of things struggling, the Spurs are the next team up uh, right now. They're currently playing the Suns. What score is that? They're right down now? 18. That's what I thought. Uh, things haven't been great for Victor Wembanyama to start his career. And if you ask me, a big part of that is uh, the guard play on the Spurs. Not very good. Specifically, the Spurs are insisting running Jeremy Sohan at the point guard spot. And I understand that jumbo playmakers are kind of in right now. Guys like, like a Josh Giddy, for example, or a Shea, like these big playmakers that can go out you there. Name, and, names both guards on the thunder. I mean, that's what we're doing. I mean, even like the Raptors tried to do it last year with Scotty Barnes and he really struggled and he is putting it together. Now it feels like he could play that role, but a jumbo playmaker feels like it's an archetype that a lot of teams want at this point in the league the Spurs are seemingly trying to do it with Sohan, and I don't know, man. I just don't see it at all with Scotty. I've kind of seen the vision here and there, but even then, I don't like him as a point guard. I like him as like a point forward. They're just trying to run him out there, and when Trey Jones has been out there, the offense looks so much better for this team, like way better. But even when he's out there, really whoever's out there, they're just not really getting Wemby the ball. There have been multiple times in these first few games where he'll have like a 6'4 dude on him in the post. He'll have him sealed off. And, and he just has his hands up and he's waving. He's waving and someone takes like a pull-up three or something. It's been abysmal to watch and it sucks because Wemby's pretty much out there mostly shooting threes. I remember last time I checked his stats, he had like, he was like 0-5 from the field, but 0-3 from three. Yep. Yeah, he's 1-6. 1-6. Six. 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 But 0-3 from three, like most of his shots feel like they're coming from the three-point line because that's the only spot he's actually getting the ball. So... It's been rough out there. It's going to take some time. There's going to be growing pains for a Spurs team that doesn't have a ton of talent. It's just disappointing because it feels like Wemby could be doing so much more and be so much more impactful offensively. They're just really not involving him. They haven't figured out how to utilize this 7-4 demigod quite yet, and it's I think it's really hurt them. Yeah, I mean, and, and we, can, we, can, we can kind of crap on like the Spurs roster makeup all we want, but Wemby also hasn't, even when he has had the looks, hasn't looked... At, with the potential is so there, and I think you'd have to be a really dumb fan or just like the c most hot take person in the world to say that he's a bust or that he's gonna, you know, not get to his expectations. But I mean, the flashes are definitely there, man. With like, the, there's so I swear every night he has at least one like insane highlight reel, but we just haven't really seen like him put together like that night where like that's the dude, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it's gonna take some time. I mean, he's you know, still trying to adjust. We've seen multiple of the top rookies struggle so far. We'll talk about Scoot later. Him and Scoot have both really struggled to begin, or Scoot more so. Scoot has really struggled I mean, to start off We can also career. just hop into Portland real quick. They've also been hot doo-doo. Yeah, I guess we can move straight into Portland. We'll come back to the Kings because they're next in the order. But yeah, Portland has not been good. Ryan's belief in them as a future 10 seed Seems to have been misplaced again. In, in my early. defense, I didn't think Anthony Simons would have a basically season ending injury on the first week of the year. He's only out for six weeks. He'll be back soon. That's a pretty long time. That's a lot of games you can lose. But yeah, they've been uh, bad. They did beat the Raptors last game, which I guess speaks to more about how bad the Raptors have been so far. But they've been getting decimated. They lost by 12 to the Clippers, and it really wasn't that close. Only beat them uh, by almost 30. 
yeah, Philly almost beat him by 30. The Magic only beat him by five. But again, that was a game where they kind of battled back and forth. They kept the game close, but I'm watching that and it never felt like it was, it never felt like the Magic were truly in danger of blowing These are also that teams though, that aren't like playoff locks in the East, like the Magic and the Raptors. Like these are team play or these are teams who projected between that like 10 and 12 spot. You know what I mean? Yeah. And a big part of that has been Scoot really struggling. He did have 11 points and seven assists against the Raptors. I liked a lot of his playmaking. I think it's, it's tough with the Ra- or with the Blazers. I thought the talent around him would kind of help him up to this point. I don't know if it's been super benefit. I think also losing Simons in the backcourt next to him is killer because he misses that partner that can go ahead and stretch the floor. Uh, Aiton's been really disappointing so far. I thought he could have a huge season. He talked all about how I'm dominating and all this stuff coming into Portland, how he was hype. Been super mediocre so far. I mean, he had the best game of his season so far against the Raptors, but four games he's putting up 8.8 points per game like <laughs> dude had 23 rebounds that's crazy it's funny i saw someone post uh a bet that they made and they're like this is the only bet i made of the night and it was deandre in under on rebounds and he had 23 so <laughs> doesn't always work out but yeah but he's it's still just not scoring though either just still only 10 points man <sighs> yeah i mean he's not and the Raptors don't really have a. I mean, Yaka, I guess Yaka Pertle's there, but I mean, I don't know. If he's he's not really just he's he's just not really shooting that much. And he, I mean, he got dominated by Embiid. Embiid is always kind of kicked in his butt. So, yeah, I don't know. It's just it's. I was hoping they would be more fun than they have been so far. They've been really hard to watch up to this point. Shaden Sharp has had some big moments. I like what I've seen from him so far. Brogdon's and, been like their best player too. Yeah, Brogdon's going to get them a nice asset throughout this year. Like he's right. going to be someone that gets picked up by some other teams. They'll get a nice first round pick or two for that man. So yeah, that's pretty much it for the Blazers. Uh, get well soon, Simons. Aiton and Scoot have struggled. Not really concerned about Scoot. He's going to be perfectly fine. It's just going to take some time. It's hard for young guards to adjust to the league, especially when they've got the the generational like franchise savior expectations on their shoulders on a Blazers team that's been really kind of mismatched and put together. They're so still trying to find their rhythm. Uh, Robert Williams, I thought, has looked good. He hasn't played a ton of minutes, which he usually doesn't, but I've liked what I've seen from him in those minutes. Yeah, I think that's all we've got for Portland. So let's uh, move. I guess we go back to the Kings. Kings have looked good. Uh, De'Aaron Fox is still unbelievable in the clutch. Had, I think, 19, 20 points against the Warriors in the clutch. He hurt his ankle really bad in their last game. And that ended up going to overtime against the Los Angeles Lakers. Uh, They end up... That was a really fun one. Some about these like in like interdivision Pacific games seem to always go crazy. Like Kings Warriors, really might just be the Kings, but like Kings Clippers last year that was like one seventy five to one seventy six. <laughs> I see a common denominator here. Yeah, but I mean, even like the Lakers Suns game with LeBron facing off against Kevin Durant recently was kind of fun. But mm. Kings games are just incredible. But Fox ends up getting hurt uh, in overtime. They do end up. Uh, beating that Lakers team in overtime with Fox on the bench and Malik Monk um, coming through and balling out there in overtime. Fox is going to be out for like roughly a week or so, a little bit more. So it's not a super long-term injury, but yeah, just shout out to him. One clutch player of the year. Seems like he's easily the front runner so far to go ahead and do so. Although Luca has also been ridiculous in the fourth quarter. We'll talk about him later. Uh, Yeah. You got anything else you want to add about the Kings? Uh, Yeah. I think the Kings are just like kind of what we both talked about. We think they're both going to be really good. We just think they're ceiling isn't anything too crazy. You know what I mean? Like they're going to be a a strong playoff team and play a lot of good games. Just they don't really have, I think the roster to go like a deep playoff run, but we'll see. We'll see if maybe they can change your minds about that, but they've been fun and competitive. And I don't think anyone thought they were going to be bad. I just think a lot of people thought they overperformed last year, which, you know, still true, I think, but we'll see. Yeah. It's been a good start for the Kings. Um, Phoenix. Big thing for them is the injury issues have already popped up. Uh, Devin Booker, ankle injury, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. Doesn't have a timetable for return at the moment. Bradley Beal, back injury, has not played yet this season. Does not have a timetable for return. They've still been holding their own. Frank Vogel coming out with that quote is really cryptic to me about these time tape, no timetables for both of them. Like, that's, I don't know. I don't know if it was just the Halloween in me that was like, why is this so like cryptic and weird? It's ominous. It is ominous. But. I don't know, man. There was also that video of Beal putting up shots in the practice facility, and he looked really stiff. Like it didn't seem like he was probably that close to coming back. Dude, so I was seeing the Markel Fultz uh, comparisons on the timeline, which is crazy for Beal, who's in like his what, like how many years has Beal been in the league at this 11. point? Like probably something like like that. I think he was like the 2011 or 2012 draft. But the Suns have still been holding their own. Uh, they've been 
solid so far. I mean, they're about to win. It seems like against the Spurs, unless Wemby comes through and does something ridiculous. Do pray. Yeah, we'll see. But they're uh, two and one, about to be three and one. It seems like with Booker only playing the first game and uh, Beal not playing at all so far, not not bad for a team that wasn't supposed to have much depth, holding their own. Kevin Durant has looked good. If they can stay afloat, I think it's going to be big for them. But again, this was kind of the concern with this team. We were worried, could they stay healthy? And so far, it seems like they're not going to be able to. And if you can't stay healthy, you can't beat a team specifically like the Denver Nuggets out there in the West. You're not going to be able to do it if you don't have Beal Booker and Kevin Durant all out there on the court. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like we were talking about earlier with the Clippers and the Harden thing. You might be able to win like a first round series if you just had like Durant and Booker or Durant and Beal. You know, but you're not going to get past that with just the two of them. You need the whole big three. And oh, as Wemby makes a three, he's alive. But he, uh, is. <laughs> he is here. He hit the spot up shooter. Wemby is back. But I just really think the Suns need to figure out. I don't know, man. I'm just worried because I don't think Eric Gordon as your second best player is just sustainable <laughs> for a very long time. Like Eric Gordon has been pretty good and he stepped up. But they just, they just got to figure it out, whether it's just, like, get these dudes back on the court or, like, do they need to make other moves to improve depth in case this is long-term issue for them? But I don't know, man. I think when all the pieces are there, they're going to be good. But it's just, like, one of those incomplete grades you can't give because Bradley Beal hasn't even stepped on the court yet. Yeah, and, I mean, again, with Frank Vogel's quote, we don't know when Beal's going to be back. We don't know when Book's going to be back. Hopefully at some point soon, because I really want to see this team play at full strength. But until then, we'll just have to wait. Uh, the Magic. Right here I've written they've been solid, even though Paolo is struggling. But I will say right now they're playing the Clippers, and that game is hideous. Not oh, just between. It? It's ugly. Uh, right now it's <laughs> – I tried to find the score <laughs> for Magic. Oh, man. That's a first quarter score. Yeah. Now your team has 40 points, and the second quarter is about to wrap up. Uh so I tried to look up Magic Clippers mm -hmm. until I like, checked the like pull up like the. <laughs> Did box you get some like crazy haircut? Uh, ads yeah, hold on. I'm gonna I'm gonna share this. I'm gonna share this on the on the screen. Hold up. I tried to search this on my computer. This is what came up when I tried to search Magic Clippers. I mean, pretty much, bro. When you're when it's 38 to 32 and it's almost halftime. I mean, yeah, they don't want to show me that. So, yeah. yeah. Ooh, five stars, bro. You might want to get it. Yeah, I might want to hop on that deal rather than watch the game. Yeah, it's it's been an ugly game so far. But even still, I mean, the Magic are winning 38-31 to 31 right now. Paolo hasn't looked great up to this point. But again, with them still winning, it's not the worst thing. 2-1, and one, nearly beat the Lakers if Jalen Suggs hits that three last night, which he was all over the court at the end of that game. But if he hits that three and the game goes to overtime, they maybe had a chance to go 3-0. and oh. They missed a couple of shots. It's going to happen. They're a young team. They're inexperienced. They're trying to figure out what this team's going to look like going forward. Mm -hmm. But obviously, you do want to see Paolo play a bit better. Through the first three games, he's putting up 11.7 points, shooting below 40% from the field, below 20% from three. He's playmaking well. He's rebounding. Like, he's still making winning plays. He's just not been the ball dominant. Not been the guy. Ball. Like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. He hasn't been that alpha score that we expect Paolo to eventually become for this team in the way he was last year, which... I expect him to get back to it at some point, but it hasn't been the case so far. And also in this Clippers game that we're talking about, again, it's going on right now. He's got, I think, two points in 13 minutes. So again, not a lot of offense coming from Palo up to this point. I think another thing that concerns me a little bit about Palo is they haven't been playing the, that great of teams either. Like the Lakers like were a little hurt and like they're coming off a of back-to-back and Palo didn't look great. They played Houston and I think everyone was all over that as a smash bot for Palo didn't really look like anything of much was going on there but especially i mean there was a rivalry game between him and jabari you know you know picks that were pinned up against well, one another the magic magic did, did beat him by 30 so they did but much of the game it, it is true it's just i don't know i just feel like we haven't had that performance from him yet this year it's, it's just like kind of putting up like role player numbers when he's supposed to be the that dude yeah which is I think fine when you're playing these types when you're playing houston who's been hot doo-doo but I don't know, man. I just feel like for them to take that next step that a lot of people think they're going to take this year, he has to be the guy. Like, he can't just be, like, going with the flow and putting up, like, 12 to 13 a game with a couple of boards and a couple of assists. It's not going to happen. You're going to – there's it's not sustainable. Yeah. I he, He'll come around. It's just up to this point to doing our takeaways now. Powell hasn't been great so far. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Speaking of guys that were taken in that top three of uh, last year's draft, Chet Holmgren, man. Talk about my Oklahoma City Thunder. Chet has been unbelievable so far. He has been incredible. A fantastic defensively, offensively. He's been all around. He's been our second best player so far behind Shea. Like a ridiculous impact on any given night. Uh, last game, he knocked down against the Pistons. He knocked down four threes and had four blocks. The only player in Thunder history to ever do so. Currently, he's averaging over two blocks per game and two three-pointers made per game. If he kept that up, he'd be the only player in NBA history to do that. Uh, he's been scoring well defensively again, like I said, been phenomenal against Jalen Duran. Duran had been destroying the league up until that point. Chet really stopped him. And just the Pistons as a whole, that Cade Cunningham, Jalen Duran pick and roll has been huge for them. They've been dominating with that through their first two games. Chet completely shut that down. Like it basically did not exist in the game against the Thunder. He's been good. Uh, Jokic kind of gave him the work a little bit, but Jokic has given the work to everybody, including Anthony Davis. So I'm not concerned about that. He had seven blocks against Evan Mobley, making him look like he didn't belong out there at some points next to Chet. Hit a big time clutch three to tie that game up in our comeback. He's been everything and more. Like I picked Chet to win rookie of the year. I thought he would be a highly impactful player. But I have to say, through these first few games, he's been even more impactful than I was anticipating from day one. It feels like he's a guy that last season, while he couldn't play because he was out with injury, really took the time to study the game, get better physically, continue to work on his game over that that season, rather than you know just being like, oh, okay, I'll sit on the bench, I'll wait. He grinded, he stayed working, he's learned, he's really put the time in. And you could see it out there on the court. He doesn't move like he's a seven-footer either. He has really been everything and more that this team needs. And he's a reason why I'm really confident in this Thunder team going forward. I was confident in us going to the season. But if Chet's playing like this, if Chet keeps putting up like right now his numbers, I'm going to go ahead and get the exact number so I don't get this wrong. He's putting up 15 points per game, 6.2 boards, 2 assists, a steal, and 2.8 blocks per game. If he gets those rebounds up a little bit, those are like kind of, if the Thunder are good, those are interesting all-star type numbers. I don't think he'd make it because there's so many great bigs in the Western Conference. Mm -hmm. But I do think he could get at least a little bit of conversation. He's also, meanwhile, shooting 60 0.6% from the field and 62.5% from three. I swear to God, he does not miss threes up to this point. And it, it's wouldn't not be, like he, it wouldn't be a podcast with us if we didn't get the Chet propaganda. It, no, but like it's well, it's well deserved. I'm just it, it is it is deserved. But it's not like he's not shooting threes. Two of three against the Bulls, three of four against the Cavs, one of four against the Nuggets, four or five against the Pistons. He just does not miss from three point line. It feels like he always hits those shots. He's just been amazing. That was my chat rant. We can go ahead and move on to another team now, but he's been the biggest thing. Shea's also been fantastic outside of that Nuggets oh, game. Shout out, shout out. I, I'm, I'm surprised it took you this long to mention him, but shout out Shea too. Shea's been picking up right where he left off. Yeah, that Nuggets game was probably the worst game of his time as a member of the Thunder, but it's it's the reigning champs. Those games are going to happen. And again, everyone, everyone has a stinker. It's okay. Yeah. I mean, and on that yeah. same night, he struggled. Dame was like awful. One of his worst games I've seen from him. Yeah, there was just some black magic in the air that night. Some was weird with star guards. It just didn't work. Uh, but okay. That was my thunder rant. We can go ahead and move on to the Knicks. Um, I've written down RJ Barrett has been really good so far this season. He has been looked at to become a more consistent option for them. And so far he's been probably their most consistent offensive player, it feels like, putting up 21 points per game, shooting 45% from the field, 43% from deep. He's been really good from the outside, which they need him to continue to do. He's been good. I don't know if he, he hasn't been like an all-star caliber player quite yet. He's been putting up really solid option or third option numbers, though, if he can keep doing that, especially while Randall in particular has really struggled to start this year. He has been bad. Yeah, I know you were talking about that before the podcast, that Randall's been struggling. Uh, Brunson... Hasn't been, been scoring as efficient. Yeah, he he's shooting really well from three, but under 40% from the field, um, 19.8 points per game, which is low for Brunson. The assist numbers are down a little bit. Again, it's the beginning of the season. I'm not super concerned. But so far, Barrett being their most consistent player in a stretch where I think they're two and two at this point. They lost Every the game Celtics. Been competitive, though, even their losses, like that loss against the Celtics that they had. Yeah, they were really competitive against a great Celtics team. And they were they were getting blown out early, but they stuck in it. Again, with Randall really struggling, Brunson struggled in that game too. They've just got a lot of really solid role players. They've got some depth. Barrett's been good. I thought it's been a promising start to the season for the Knicks. 
Yeah, man. I just my one thing with the Knicks is I think they're a really solid team, but I think that's kind of their ceiling is a really solid team. They're just one of those like perennial, I feel like second round teams. You know what I mean? Like they're better than like the bottom three or four teams that make the playoffs, but they just don't have the ceiling raiser on their roster to really get them to that level that some of these other teams are at. Like you know what I mean? They don't have that top. Brunson might be pushing it, and Randall could be, but they don't just have like that clear top twenty player. You know what I mean? That yeah, they, they need. They need like the guy. It, I I agree with you. I don't think the roster is extremely. I think I would argue top to bottom they have one of the best rosters in the whole NBA. Like I think they just have really solid players all around. Mm -hmm. You said one of the best. That guy. You said one of the best rosters in the NBA. Sorry, you cut out a little bit. You lagged. Yeah, like like as like as a whole, I'm not saying like oh yeah, I know what you're saying. Than than a lot of these other teams that are way better than them. But I'm just saying as terms of like they have shooters rebounders tough guys guys that can be the number one option to give a night like they just have really solid players i feel like on their team that they can mm -hmm. put out there and their rotations like when you have plug and play guys like hart divincenzo and then you have some bucket getters here and there like grimes can come out of nowhere and just shoot lights out and then like you said rj brunson and randall like the three of them are that's three really solid options but it's not like any of those i'm like bring bring me randall in the final Brunson, to, you know like mm -hmm. they're really really good they just don't have that guy i think they're just going to be stuck being like that four to five seat every year until they get like because i remember when the knicks before they were like barely a playoff team everyone was photoshopping like zion and all these other really good play Kyrie, like mm -hmm. all these really good players even in beat at points and like these knicks jerseys in there and donovan mitchell that was another one that was big there's all i think until one of those photoshops becomes a reality they're just going to be stuck in this kind of like r really solid purgatory. Yeah, it's I, and that's a good thing about the Knicks is they've got some interesting young talent. They've got like all their first round draft picks and pick swaps going forward. When a superstar player does become available, the Knicks are probably going to be at the front of that line. And I do think when that player becomes available and they make that deal, like you said, with a really solid team around that player. I think the Knicks are they're going to take it to the next level. It's just a matter of time for when someone does become available. Hmm. But okay, next we've got the New Orleans Pelicans. Uh, we might want to speed this up a little bit. I know we're taking a while on some of these teams. Uh, the Pelicans have looked good when healthy, which has always been the case with the Pelicans. And like, which is funny because that's what we said in our standings video. We said that if we, mm -hmm. <laughs> you had them low because you thought they weren't going to be healthy, I had them higher because I thought when they were healthy, they were pretty good. So pretty much <laughs> what we have about them now is exactly the same. Like they have some talented players, but Ingram's missed some time. I mean, yeah, Zion Ingram missed that game against Mark. Ingram missed that game against the Warriors, and they got destroyed, which the Warriors have also just been good. But, yeah, they got blown out. Uh, they had a close game against the Knicks where they held them to 87 points, which was a good showing. Uh, beat the Grizzlies by seven. So they've had close games here and there in their wins. Uh, they've got a game against my Thunder tomorrow, which is going to be really fun. Excited for that one. I think that's a big test. Uh, Ingram is questionable. It already feels like injuries are kind of starting for this team between him. Trey Murphy still isn't back. But when he, Zion, CJ, Valanciunas, like Herb, when they have their top guys on the court. And Trey Murphy, they, don't forget, he hasn't even played yet. Yeah, like they look good. It's just, again, as always a matter if they can actually stay healthy and Ingram being hurt already in this season, which it's just apparently some soreness. Hopefully it doesn't keep him out for any more games. But – it is a little bit of a concern for me that things like this are already popping up. So, yeah, shout out to the Pelicans. Shout out, good. shout out Jordan Hawkins. That kid's kind of a hooper. Jordan, Jordan Hawkins is nice. He's I, One of my favorite things about – I like when there are shooters that know that their role is supposed to shoot. They don't hesitate at all. Jordan Hawkins is one of those guys that he knows that my goal is to shoot the basketball when they give it to me. And anytime he gets the ball on the three-point line, he's immediately chucking that thing up, and I like that. I like that like non-hesitation from him. I like that draft pick a lot for him. I know, or for the Pelicans, there were a lot of people who didn't like that when the pick happened. I was a believer. So uh, next we've got Minnesota. Minnesota right here. All we have written for them appropriately because they're a wolf is woof. Not been a great start to the season for the Minnesota Timberwolves. They, if they uh, if they played as well as their Brazil team posted, oh, uh, Lord. Team, then they wouldn't have lost that game to the Hawks. But honestly, the Hawks did to the Wolves what the Wolves claim they did to uh, what team was that that they beat the, that they made the meme for the viral one <sighs> was it was the Heat, which doesn't make any sense why that video was. If you all haven't seen the Timberwolves Brazil video, you don't need to go see it. It's no, nah, there's no way. If you're watching this podcast, there's no way you have not seen that video. It's horrifying. It was like this. We we don't need to get into it, but pretty much, 
yeah, the Wolves have struggled. It's been bad offensively. They lost to the Raptors' first game. Um, did well against the Heat, beat them by 16, put up a good performance. Um, the Heat were missing Jimmy Butler in that game, so that is one thing to keep in mind. And then against the Hawks, they looked amazing in the first half. Anthony Edwards cooking them. They're holding up defensively. They were up 19 points at halftime, like, and it looked like it was over. And it's against the Raptors, or not the Raptors, the Hawks, the Hawks. excuse me, Solid who team. have like the Hawks have, you know, leading up to that game, like they, they did beat the Bucks, which was a good game, but they had been very up and down to start the season. They've been very inconsistent and they came back. And not only did they win that game after being down 19 at halftime, they won by 14 points. They blew them out. They were up by almost 20 at some points. They outscored the Timberwolves 38 to 19 in the third quarter and 29 to 15 in the fourth quarter. They nearly doubled them up in both quarters. Part well, of that Sean was the performance of the ages, man. I think he had 22 points in the third, hit that big three. He was just destroying them. The defense was doing nothing. Nobody was doing anything outside of Anthony Edwards. Like Jane McDaniels was back. This team just doesn't have a lot of offense. Cat has been really bad to start the year. Gobert has been great defensively, but when he's on the court, the defense looks great, but the offense kind of struggles and then they take him off and nothing's really working. I don't know, man. This Timberwolves team just... It's not been a good start to the season. It feels like there's talent there and that they should be able to make something work, but they just, I don't know. It just doesn't feel like it's working at this point. I feel like the Wolves are going to be the first coaching change of the year. It would not surprise me. I, if that, I think that's actually a pretty interesting bet to make, like in terms of if you're trying to pick somebody, because I don't see many early season candidates that are going to get canned, but the Wolves feel like a team that after last year, needs to perform and if they're not performing if they keep playing like this like blowing a 19 point lead it's not all in the head coach but they were making no adjustments murray was torching them they could not get a stop they couldn't buy a bucket it felt like chris finch did nothing he just stood there and let it happen so i don't know what like clearly what you're doing in the first half was not it, it wasn't working anymore or if you made an adjustment like that adjustment wasn't working at this point change something do something anything he didn't do anything um yeah, not a good start for the Timberwolves. Again, the offense just looks bad. And they've got a rough schedule coming up, uh, specifically in their next three games. They play the Nuggets, then the Jazz, who haven't been great so far, but then the Celtics. And if they lose, like say they lose those two games, uh, they'll be two and four to start the season, which you know is not a death sentence by any means. But in the Western Conference, that's not a great spot to be. And after that, play, they play the Pelicans. They play the Warriors a couple of times. They play the Suns, the Pelicans, the Knicks, the Sixers, the Kings, the Grizzlies, the Thunder. Like, they play all these. One of those teams don't belong. <laughs> Which of those teams did I say? <laughs> we'll get, we're about to talk about them. Which team was it? I'm, I'm not sure what team we're, was. We're Anyways. A couple. Okay. But yeah, it's just oh yeah, the Grizzlies. That's, that's, that's <laughs> I just always think of the Grizzlies as a good team at this point. But it's it's scary, and I I can agree. If they continue to play like this, they're going to lose a majority of those games. Chris Finch could be the first guy out. So yeah, I agree. That's if if I had to pick someone that could be the first coaching change, I think I would go with Chris Finch. Uh, anything else to say for the Timberwolves other than you know pray for Anthony Edwards and hope that he gets some offensive help free him i think he should go to philly for two first round picks from the clippers <laughs> for, for two and marcus morris yeah for two first round picks marcus morris nick batum robert covington perhaps yeah all right uh next we have the milwaukee bucks thoughts on the bucks i don't think there's a ton to say about them middleton has been a non-factor he played the first game and i think he sat the last two so it's yeah, just middleton. like is middleton gonna be a factor because they've had the minutes limit and then they just haven't been playing him and they you could tell how much they needed that when dame had like the disaster class of the century and Giannis couldn't do it all on his own so having middleton there would have been really helpful you know when dame had probably the worst game of his career but i just think we kind of have in there that just, they just need to gel and kind of figure it out like yeah. we saw that game against the sixers that was like an awesome game between two really good teams like we've seen like you know what they're capable of dame's had some really good games 
but then we've had I've seen a couple stinkers, and it's just like, how are they getting blown out by the Hawks like that? Who at the at the time had been pretty bad. Trey Young had put up two disaster classes of the. They had been year. awful leading into that game in their first two. Yeah, that was a good turnaround for them to start their season, but it's just like you have to make sure everyone else is locked in because if Dame or Giannis have an off night, you can't, you're going to get bl- we can't have them getting blown out and one of them has a bad night. You know what I mean? You got to still be able to rally behind the rest of the troops. So. I think they'll end up getting it and they'll end up being fine. But I think we talked about this, why we thought the Celtics were going to be a lot more seamless of a transition. Like sure. You're putting KP, and maybe we can talk about the Celtics while we're, I'm bringing this up, but we knew when they brought in KP and drew, like they were going to be hopping in with Tatum and Brown. And it was going to be very similar types of basketball. It was just going to be the Jays balling and then drew kind of playing a better Marcus smart role. And then KP just taking wide open shots because everyone's worried about the Jays. So I feel mm-hmm. like it was a lot easier of a transition for them and why they've looked so good this year. And especially KP who I still can't, we'll never forgive Adam silver for letting that trade go through because that was like the most perfect player they could have gotten. And it's, and it's shown like his first game was awesome. And then he's had two like not as good games, but it's just been because they're beating the crap out of everybody so far. So yeah, they're they're destroying teams like against the Wizards. Was, that was a slaughter, man. He was destroying them. It didn't matter. Like they just didn't have the height. They put Kuzma at the five. Like what were they gonna do out there? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. He, that first game really was the big one against the Knicks. He got them that win. Hit a couple of huge clutch buckets. Start off really hot. He just gets so many wide open shots. Like he is the perfect type of player for that team. And I I said that like when the trade happened, I was like, oh, this is huge. I don't think a lot of people watched the Wizards last year and realized how good KP was because he was really good. He's been a seamless fit for this team so far. They're one of, I think, three undefeated teams at this point or two undefeated teams. Mm-hmm. Uh, three undefeated teams. Mavericks are still undefeated too. Celtics, Nuggets, Mavericks. But they they just look really good. Like I don't know what else to say about the Celtics. We knew they were going to be really good. They've been really good so far. I wonder when they play the Nuggets for the first time. I'm curious about when that matchup is. I'm going to see if I can find that. Oh, it's not for a while down this schedule. January 19th is the first time they play the Denver Nuggets. So, man, your game dream is match is a little out of reach. Yeah, game game to go ahead and circle in the calendar there. I'm really excited to see that one because they feel like the best two teams in the NBA so far mm-hmm. and they play they've played like it, which I guess we can go ahead and talk about Denver too. Similar thing for the Celtics. I mean, not really that much to say about the Denver Nuggets. They're just still the best team in the world. Jokic is the best player in the world. Uh, Jamal Murray's looked good. Michael Porter Jr. forgot how to shoot for the first few games, but against the Thunder, seemingly figured it out. Aaron Gordon and KCP are playing right. like that's how it goes, man. It always feels like that. But KCP and Aaron Gordon feel like they're playing all defensive level defense to start the season. That's the big thing. The Nuggets defense to begin this year feels so much improved from last season. Like last mm-hmm. year, they were this offensive juggernaut that struggled defensively, and people are like, hey, can they hold up in the playoffs? They did so, and now so far through the early going of the season, they're top five defense in the league, according to defensive rating, which I don't know if that's going to hold or not, but with the way that Jokic continues to get better as a defender, he is, I would say, probably about an average defender, if not maybe a little bit better on some nights at this point. He's no longer this massive liability like he used to be. Uh, Ken Tavis called Will Pope and Aaron Gordon are locking up. MPJ's taking huge strides as a defender as well, like – this team's defending their butts off. Peyton Watson gives them some length. Reggie Jackson looked good in some of these games. Not great in other ones, but he's been fine so far as a backup point guard, and that's really all you need. Uh, Zeke Naji a bit hit or miss, but he's coming along. Christian Brown's been phenomenal. Just play more of the role that he did in their finals run. The Nuggets are just the best team in the world. I don't really know what else to say about them. They took what they did last year. They're building on it, and they just seem like a better team on both sides of the ball so far. Still think they need to improve the bench. I'm just going to put that out there. Yeah. And that's the thing awesome. with them too is. Their starting five yeah. is unreal. Them and the Celtics have the most um, complete starting fives in the NBA. Yeah. They're – they're un- like those two teams feel like at this point, which it's not only because they're undefeated, but so far those two teams, which were – by the way, I want to say I picked them to play in the final, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> but subtle, subtle flex. Yeah, subtle flex. You know, picking the consensus probably matchup to play in the finals. How, how dare you, bro? Yeah, a big a big flex there. But they've they've just looked like the best teams in hoop so far. Mm-hmm. But okay, we can go ahead back now to the let's talk about we the Grizzlies. Up with the Hawks. We finish up with the Hawks real quick because we we've talked about them like three or four different times. There's just I think one other player you wanted to mention for them. That we yeah, I want to talk about Jalen Johnson real quick. Jalen Johnson's been amazing. He was a player that a lot of people thought could be a breakout guy this season. They needed somebody to step up. 
Jalen Johnson's been amazing. When you talk about like these jumbo kind of playmaking, like connecting wings, not really playmaking as much, but more so connecting. Jalen Johnson fits that mold. Uh, 14.5 points per game, scoring nearly 70% from the field, 40% from three. The three-point shot hasn't been good in the first few years of his career. We'll see if it holds up. It's not on great volume, but they don't need him to shoot a lot of threes. Uh, seven boards, two assists, 1.5 steals, a block. Great transition player. I love his fit alongside a number of these guys. He's been phenomenal. Like It feels like he is becoming one of those players that they need. And in the early going of most improved player talks, he's up there in that conversation. It's like him, it's Tyrese Maxey, Cam Thomas, who we can talk about here in a few moments if we want to as well. Max or Cam Thomas has been unbelievable for the net so far. Like those guys feel like some of the top players. He was a candidate that a lot of people kept an eye on, maybe not as like the winner of the award, but a big breakout candidate. He's done so, so far. Loved watching some Jalen Johnson hoops. He also had that game or not that game, but that play against the Knicks where he dunked on two guys at the same time, which is enough to win the award in my opinion. So, and not to not, not to dunk on uh, AJ Griffin, but I think everyone expected him to take the leap and kind of hop into that role. And he's been okay to start the year, but Jalen Johnson is definitely, you know, taking the reins. Yeah, AJ Griffin just he hasn't gotten that many minutes. Like when he's played, he's been great. It's just like you said, the the role hasn't been significant so far, partially because Jalen Johnson's been so good that they have to get him more and more minutes while he's. And like they moved this. into the starting lineup, which I think was a good adjustment, and that's why they've been. I think that. so too. Yeah, Sadiq Bay, I think makes more sense as a guy who can get you some buckets off the bench when yeah. Jalen Johnson's going to give you a bit more versatility. And Bay's actually spot. been pretty solid since they moved into the bench too. He's looked pretty good. Shout out to the Hawks, playing a little bit better. They were really bad to start the season. They've won two in a row, beating you know the Bucks too, and the Timberwolves who haven't been good, but coming back from down nineteen, it's a good yeah. spot. Okay, um, do you want to touch on the Nets real quick while we mentioned Cam Thomas? Yeah, real quick about the Nets. Uh, Cam Thomas is an absolute hooper. I think the thing that we knew about Cam Thomas was that we knew he could get buckets on high volume, but he's been like effective as a scorer this year. Like uh, the efficiency has been great, mm-hmm. and he's looked he's looked really good as like a top option. And the Nets have looked pretty good. I mean, they haven't played like the toughest of teams yet, but they've just played a lot of competitive games, and you know they look they look pretty solid. I think Michael Bridges isn't playing to the level that some people thought he was going to play, but I think that's because Cam Thomas has just been hooping his butt off. So he's Mm -hmm. been able to play more of that like secondary role, which I think in the, at the end of the day, I think that's more of what Mikel Bridges is. He's not a top option. He's more of like a third best player on a team that's going to win a championship, which is absolutely nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I just think they're just going to be a solid team. I like to call the Nets the, the team of all-star role players. Like Dorian Finney-Smith has looked really good since Cam Johnson got hurt and he's been inserted into the starting lineup. I mean, Ben Simmons doesn't look like an all-star, but he's been he's been fine. He's been putting. He's up been a lot, lot better than last year. Yeah. so far. That's the thing though with Ben is that like he's never going to be back to that all-star form. I don't think, but I mean, he's been fine. He's mm-hmm. like he's definitely not been bad. Like last year, he was bad. Yeah. But it's also interesting because Claxton hasn't been playing. So they've been running Ben at the five, which has been working for them because they've been playing like when you play like a team like Charlotte last week or last game, that's going to work. It'll be interesting when they play some, you know, some better competition. But I mean, for what they're doing so far, though, the Nets look good. I still think they should uh, trade some of these role players for assets at some point because they don't. I still don't think the Nets really have a direction because, like I said, I don't think Mikel Bridges is like the guy to build around. I think he's a really solid player, but. I don't know. I wouldn't build my franchise around him, though. I don't know about you. Yeah, no, but, I don't. I don't think he's a championship first option. I yeah, think he but, could be a really good three option. You know, a solid second option on a great team with the way that he's been playing. Yeah, like you said, he hasn't been putting up the numbers that he put up last season so far. But part of that has been because Cam Thomas has been just so damn good. And that's the interesting thing about the Nets because coming to the season, everyone's like, we know the defense is going to be good for the Nets, but how's the offense going to be? It's been the exact reverse. Offensively, the Nets have the fourth best offense in the league. And defensively, they have a bottom three defense, which has been a crazy turn of events. I still feel like it'll probably flip. I think it'll flip when Claxton comes back. I think that'll change things up because, again, we don't know how Ben and Claxton are going to look offensively together. And Claxton drastically improves this defense. He's amazing out there. Really underrated defensive player by some people. But Cam Thomas... The thing with him has continuously been like he's had these bursts where he comes into the starting lineup or plays big minutes and he puts up big time buckets. But is it sustainable? It's only been three games, but in these three games, 36 points on 13 of 21 shooting, 30 points, 12 of 19 shooting, 33 points on 10 of 17 shooting. He gets buckets. And 
you know, he's not giving you a lot of assists. He's put two assists up in all of his games. He's not hitting a lot of threes. He's 30.8% from the three-point line, but his floater's nice. The mid-range game is there. He's getting to the basket. He's just scoring at a high level. He has really lifted this offense up, and he needs to continue to get these big minutes. We saw last year Cam Thomas went on that run, and Jacques Vaughn kind of benched him. He just stopped playing him. And I understand Cam Thomas is a guy who's not going to pass the ball a lot. He's not going to defend very well. But this team needs offensive players. And Cam That's Thomas the thing. When you have a team full role players, man, you need a bucket getter. Yeah, Cam Thomas has been ridiculous. I'm pretty sure up to this point, he has the highest career point per game average as a starter out of any player in league history, which is ridiculous. Uh, shout out to Cam Thomas. He's been super fun so far. Again, if we're talking most improved player guys, Cam Thomas is probably at the forefront of this conversation right now, alongside, like we mentioned, like a guy like Tyrus Maxey. Mm-hmm. Next. But okay, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven teams left. We're over two thirds of the way through. Let's talk about let's talk about the Heat. I guess we should go back to where we were at originally with yep. the order. Apologize to any of you who we've thrown off by going a little bit all over the place, but you know, it's yeah. our show. It's yeah. Fun. With uh, with Miami, I think we both just kind of talked about point guard play. Jimmy kind of runs that point forward for them a lot of the time, but. Uh, it gets insane with Tyler Hero at times, but it just it's getting to the point where Kyle Lowry is just like not the guy anymore. Mm-hmm. He's been very marginal. My favorite thing ever was our friend Matt, who we've seemed to mention every episode now. We do. He's just Matt. hammering his under on points as live bets and sending them to us. And he was sending us the rent due with the Kyle Lowry under 0.5 <laughs> points. It's just so funny, man. Like we kind of talked about this, I think with our season preview, like the heat are going to be a solid team. It's just, they didn't really improve and they lost a couple, I think decent contributors. Mm-hmm. So I just think the thing with the heat is they're going to be fine, but I just think they're just going to kind of be staying afloat. I don't think they really have that high of a ceiling unless they go on another Cinderella run like they did last year. Yeah. Lowry's been better since that first game where he put up zero points. Uh, he had 13 against the Celtics, three against the Timberwolves, eight against the Bucks, but it's just, it's not great production. They're missing production from some of those other guys. They haven't figured out yet where they're going to get it from. Uh, Jimmy hasn't been good to start the season. He never plays very well in the regular season or specifically at the beginning of the year. He coasts. And I don't know how much he's going to be able to do that this season because the heat, again, like you said, feels like they lost some pieces. We're going to have to see how they stay afloat. But so far the heat have been fine. Like they haven't been bad necessarily, just, you know, not great, which again, with the heat in the regular season is kind of what I expect from them. I expect for them to kind of coast, you know, just kind of hang out and see what happens. But a one in three start isn't the way they were envisioning it. The only team that they've beaten so far is the Pistons and they won that game by one point, uh, blew up by the Timberwolves, played close against the Celtics and against the Bucks a little bit, although I think it wasn't as close as the final score indicates. They did make a big comeback in the fourth quarter. But yeah, they're going to need a little bit more from a couple of guys. They're still trying to figure things out. I don't think they're going to be bad at all this season. It's just they always coast throughout the regular season. So, yep, I agree. Um, Okay, down to our final 10 teams. Let's go ahead and go get through these. Uh, Grizzlies. Grizzlies are the next team up. Uh, Actually, I think we do a couple of these in a row. Grizzlies, very bad. Rockets, very bad. Bulls, very bad. Pistons, bad but expected, but a sore Thompson's pretty good. <laughs> but I, I just think we were just seeing a lot of these teams that like everyone at the beginning of the season was like, they're probably not going to be great. And it's a couple games in and we're like, yeah, they're not that great. So like, with the I mean, whole- the, the, the Pistons have been solid so far. I mean, we ended up kind of blowing them out in this last game, but they beat. I, I, was, just, I was being a hater just because they were the last team left on the list. That was like, that, that's not fair. Great. I know you're seeking ones to knock out. Uh, yeah. Grizzlies have looked really bad so far. No we kind of called Adams, that too, no man, when we were making our standings. Like, you know, Steven Adams gone, jaw out, and they just, the roster is nowhere near as deep as it has been because that's the reason why when like Jaws had some injuries, they've been able to stay afloat. It was just because they had a deep roster that could make up for the production. It's just, they have been very bad, man. The, I mean, just as we figured, offense terrible. Bottom five offense in the league so far. They can't score in the half court. Uh, oh, and four. I think they're the only oh, and four team in the league. I think there's the Rockets are oh, and three. Yeah, mm-hmm. they're the only oh, and four team in the league. And their schedule is easier, which should hopefully help them. They've got the Jazz twice and the Blazers twice in their next five games. They also play the Heat, but then they do have a stretch against the Clippers, the Lakers, the Spurs are in there, <laughs> um, the Celtics. So it's bless you, bless you a few times. Ryan's the. 
I'm allergic to the Grizzlies. Yeah, we'll move on so Ryan doesn't keep sneezing. But it's not been pretty for the Grizzlies. We didn't think it was going to be. They've got four games out of their next five to maybe set the tone and try and reestablish themselves. Mm -hmm. But if they start losing some of these games against the Jazz and the Blazers, things are going to get real ugly fast. I think they have to make a trade at some point. I don't know how long they can go because if they go like, you know, eight and 17 or something crazy like that leading up to Ja coming back, they're in a lot of trouble because even when Ja comes back, I don't think this offense is going to be super pretty with the front court issues and not having Steve Man Adams as that screener, that offensive rebounder. Ja's going to fix a lot of their problems, but he's not going to fix enough of them. If you ask me it, the Grizzlies haven't looked good and I'm worried it's going to get worse. Uh, like you said, Rockets also been bad so far. Um, just haven't gotten that cohesion yet from these guys. They got destroyed by the Warriors at the end of that game. It was kind of close, and then Steph Curry went completely off, blown up by the Magic in their first game. Lost the Dylan the Brooks, uh, and, the, whatever this was. Yeah, Steph, yeah, Steph Curry with. hit Dylan Brooks with like like the screen painting that <laughs> is super famous. Just not a great performance from the Rockets so far through these first three games. It's going to take time. They're a young team. They're gelling. Uh, Alperen Sengun's looked great to start the season, which has been super promising. But Fran Van Vliet's kind of struggled. Dylan Brooks has been really good to start the season. He's been efficient. He's not been taking a bunch of shots. He's kind of bought into this role, which is exactly what they need. But ultimately, it's just not resulting in wins, which neither of us thought the Rockets were going to be a super winning team this season. It's mm -hmm. a year of growth. It's a year of development. They're still waiting to see more from guys like Jabari Smith Jr., from Jalen Green. Hopefully that continues to ramp up over the course of the year. And I think I also think one guy they're really missing right now is Tari Eason, his energy, his defensive ability. It feels like they need a piece like that. And I think when Tari Eason comes back, he's going to help a lot. Is he going to get them a bunch of wins? No, but he's going to make them look like a better team. Just give them time. It's early. In case you're uh, wondering, uh, Jalen Green shooting 40% from the field and 25% from three. Yeah, it's not been great. It just feels like there's a lack of cohesion up to this point, which makes sense when you add two big time like paid players like Fred Van Vliet and Dylan Brooks, the equation. And you've got a young bunch of young players still trying to figure themselves out. There's just a bunch uh, of people I feel like trying to find their identity for a team that has doesn't have one. Yeah, it's a team that in itself is, like you said, trying to find an identity. And wrapping up kind of those teams, Ryan Slipper bad, uh, the Bulls, not been good so far. They're two and two, which the record doesn't seem bad, but they got blown up by us on opening night. Uh, they did beat the Pacers, which was a decent win. They got blown up by the Pistons in a night where Zach Levine had a career high 51 points. It wasn't even supposed to play, man. They they like they said that he was doubtful to play, and then it's like Zach Levine said he's gonna suit up, and then he just said no passing the night. Yeah, he said <laughs> he had 51 points and no dimes, which is a true Hooper stat line. That that really is the definition of a Hooper stat line. Yeah, they beat the Raptors on a buzzer beater by Alex Caruso, which they tried to throw that game away because DeMar DeRozan had like three chances to end the game in regulation with free throws and just couldn't seem to do it. So it's it's been up and down. They had a players meeting after game one of the season. I'm not expecting much from the Bulls. You're not either. We talked about them blowing it up earlier. We both think they should. That's pretty much it for the Bulls up to this point. Also, been super disappointed with Patrick Williams. We've seen nothing from him so far that's shown any growth. Yeah, we've all been expecting that leap from him, I think, for a while now. And I don't yeah. know whether it, it won't come until he gets that expanded role or what, but it's just not there right now. Yeah, I don't know if it's coming up. But yeah, beyond them, you mentioned the Pistons. Asar Thompson's been a monster. Uh, Cade and Jalen Duran have also looked good outside of the Thunder game. The pick and roll has been really fun with them. Jalen Duran is a player that I've got a lot of stock in. I think he's going to be super good. But mm. Asar Thompson, man, is ridiculous. Up to this point, I'd say he's probably been a top 10 perimeter defender in the entire league. Like, not just as a rookie, in the entire league. Last night against Shea, Shea gave him some buckets, but Asar got a couple of pokeaways on Shea. One of them resulted in a steal. The other one, Ludor grabbed and put it up and in, which was just unfortunate for him. He got, I think, two blocks on Shea, was by far their best defender on him. He's looked unbelievable so far. His shot, not there at this point. But if it comes along alongside the defense, he's blocking guys, he's getting steals, he's in the lanes, he's not afraid of anyone. You could put him in front of the best player of all time. It wouldn't matter. Asar Thompson's going to take that challenge. I love what I've seen from him so far. I was a big fan of his going into the season after watching him in the summer league in particular. He's been one of my favorite rookies to watch up to this point. Yeah, and there's – oh, free his brother, by the way. Alman Thompson, I mean, he struggled. He's, he's not been good so far. He hasn't also been getting a ton of run, though. Like, Asar, they just – they said they threw him in the starting lineup, and they're like, go crazy, young blood. And Amon, they're like, yeah, we're going to sign Fred Van Vliet to a billion dollars <laughs> and have him play yeah. your position. Yeah, not – 
still still not a fan of the whole Fred Van Bleet yeah. thing. All right, down to our last six teams. Um, the Lakers. Let's talk about the Lakers. Um, it's been up and down. I don't think they've been bad necessarily. They're yeah. two and one up to this point. Two and two. Two and two. Uh, nearly lost the Magic in that last game. That was a really crazy back and forth one. But I mean, they're, they've been all right. The, the big issue has been when LeBron's off the court, the offense looks really bad. The half the half court offense is abysmal when LeBron's out not out there. Mm-hmm. Anthony Davis has been good so far. He disappeared in the second half of the Nuggets game, but overall in the season, oh, so tragic, man. Dude, dude has 17 in the first half, and we're like, okay. And everyone's picking AD to be MVP this year, and they're like, oh, the agendas are thriving. And then he just, like, vanished. It's like that meme of Kobe going behind the pole, and they're like, mm-hmm. oh, where'd he go? Yeah. <laughs> like that, that was, like, what it was like for AD that game. Yeah. Was was not his best performance, but since then, he's been really good. I mean, so far, he's putting up 26 points per game, 52% from the field, 43% from deep, 14 rebounds, 3.2 dimes. One and a half steals, 2.8 blocks. AD looks great out there. LeBron's looked pretty good. He's not, you can tell there's a bit of regression coming for LeBron. He is still explosive, but it feels like he doesn't quite have as much as he has over the past few years. Part of that could just be him trying to take a bit more of a back seat, you know, let Anthony Davis do his thing. But really, the big issue has been even though LeBron's not putting up ridiculous numbers, which he's still putting up 22 points, shooting efficiently from the floor, 8.5 rebounds, 6.5 yeah, assists. Like he's still, uh, not great numbers from LeBron are still like top Really 10. good numbers. <laughs> yeah. So he hasn't been great, but the, the impact goes beyond what he's doing on the court. Like his ability to get downhill and attack the basket, kick out the shooters, his ability to just put some pressure on the defense. They haven't really had that. And part of that has been Austin Reeves has looked really bad so far. He struggled. Okay, Vincent's been up and down. D'Lo has been better as of late, but struggled to begin. Torian Prince, either literally, Ryan, I don't know if you've looked at Torian Prince's stats or kept like close attention to them. I'm going to go ahead and read these to the audience. First game, 18 points, four of six from deep. Second game, zero points, didn't hit a single shot. Kings, 20 points, five of 13 from deep. Magic, four points. O of two from deep. He is either putting up like 18, 20 points, knocking down five, six threes. So or he's not hitting a single shot. The, I should put I should put my house on this next game for him. Yes. Dorian Dorian Prince. Who do they play Who, next? Who do they play next? Lakers next play. They got next. They have the they've got the Clippers. Mm. On the second half of a back to back. Oh, so tomorrow? Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Do you think Jimbo plays? I uh, I don't think so. I don't think he'll play yet. Yeah, I can't believe he's already there. <laughs> he got there immediately. It's crazy. I mean, it seems like he might have known. Like again, he was laughing up with PJ Tucker on the sideline. Him and Russ are embracing when he gets there. Steve Ballmer's there. Also, by the way, uh, Spurs have come back. Made oh, a close game. Yeah, Vic's up to fourteen points right now. Kellen Johnson's got twenty-one. Okay, they're okay. playing good. Kevin Durant and Eric Gordon are trying to do their things, but. Eric Gordon, the best number two option in the league, baby. There he is. So, yeah, it's it's been up and down for the Lakers. They've got to figure out how to be better in the non-LeBron minutes. Mm-hmm. Austin Reeves has to be way better for the money that they gave him. I think they'll come along, but it's been shaky to start off. The rotation also has been hit or miss. There's a number of lineups that they put out there that I'm just like, what is Darvin Ham doing? Which has been something we've seen a little bit from him since he became the coach for the Lakers. So maybe that's just a thing that's going to be happening. Mm-hmm. But all around, I, they haven't been bad, but they haven't been great. Yeah. Uh, pa- speaking of teams that have been fun, actually, this time outside the Lakers, uh, the Pacers have been really fun. They're a run and gun team that's just going to shoot a bunch of threes. The pace is ridiculous. Whether it's a made shot, a missed shot, they're running that ball in transition. And it's been super fun. It's I think they are 2-1 and one up to this point. So it's gotten them a couple of wins. Uh, they had that huge win against the Wizards where they blew them off the court. They're, I'm, they're, seeing theme, I'm seeing a theme here. Yeah. <laughs> well, shout out to the Wizards for. I mean, they beat the Grizzlies, so that's. that's I'm also seeing that. a theme there, though. So. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. But yeah, the Pacers have been really fun. That's really all I have to say about them up to this point. And our agendas I, were looking good because we were both on the Pacers above the win total. So the yeah, were, they're they were a team that felt like they could take a bit of a leap while also being really fun. If you're looking for a good leap pass team, check out the Pacers. Uh, for the Golden State Warriors, Chris Paul. It's looked good. He's been huge for them so far. Not many turnovers, a lot of dimes, but most importantly, they're actually winning games on the road. And when Steph is off the court, they're still producing. 
which is a big it's part. It's not the norm. No, it's not. Last season, they were abysmal. Whenever Steph came off the court, they blew any lead immediately. Has not been the case. Chris Paul has been a big factor in that. Moses Moody has looked great. Gary Payton II has been good for them. They just look good. They look like they're back to the Warriors of not last year, but the year before, where mm-hmm. they feel like they could be one of the better teams in the West. I like the acquisition a lot when they made it, and it feels like it's working out super well to start off the season. Their bench rotation outside of Chris Paul is kind of weird. Yeah. But uh, like, I mean, it's funny because I feel like they usually have a bunch of name stays and like people that like kind of fit their system, but their bench right now is what, like Chris Paul, Dario? Uh, Dario has been – it's – Super weird. For some reason, I just don't believe that Dario is actually there on the Warriors. They've it's, got two rook, two rookies. Uh, it's yeah, Kaminga's out there. Moody's out there. But I mean, Chris Paul, like having him be that playmaker outside of Steph at the guard position, it, ma- it elevates so everybody's game. game. It it's makes so with, big. Yeah, like they've needed that guy, and that's part of the reason I like the it a lot the idea of trading Jordan Poole for him obviously like just in terms of straight upside you probably lose that because Jordan Poole is a young player who feels like he could be really good someday yeah but if you're trying to win now with this team you had to give up a young piece and I think getting Chris Paul has, so far has worked out beautifully for them yeah um okay you want to talk about Derek Lively for a moment yeah man uh with the Mavericks we all knew that it was gonna be Luca hard carrying and he's been insane he's hitting video game shots unbelievable He's been like, I, I think if I had to pick an MVP right now, I think he's leading the way, like after the first week. Probably. But, um, he, and then part of the reason why I think they're going to be better is I'm a big fan of Derek Lively, man. It's about time they have someone who can play the five. That's not Dwight Powell. Like, it is just, <laughs> it is just like them and the Hornets, man, have driving me, they drive me crazy. The Hornets at least have Mark Williams now, who's a little bit more serviceable. But it's just like they, they're those teams that just refuse to have good centers along good guards. Like, why did it take so long for LaMelo to have someone to throw to that wasn't uh, Mason Plumley? Mm. Or, like, why has Luka never had a center that's <laughs> better than Dwight Powell? It just yeah. doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, giving Luka an athletic big seems like it makes sense to go up and catch lobs, like, get offensive boards, just be a threat out there. Mm. It makes sense. So I don't know why they haven't done it up until now. And here's um, the whole they reason they won their first game. They were looking kind of mid, and they're like they threw lively in there, and it's just like the whole the whole pace change. He's had some foul trouble because you know he's a young player, but when he's been in there, I think he's looked pretty good. Sorry, I just sneezed. If That's y'all okay. watching, I mean, the video, I, I was doing it like rapid fire five minutes ago. You're good. <laughs> But yeah, when Derek Lively's been on the court, they've looked so much better on both ends of the ball. He gives them that rebounding that they need. He gives them the athleticism. It just makes the Mavericks more dangerous. And like you said, Luca, I mean, first three games, 39 points, 12 boards, 9.7 assists, 56% from the field, nearly 50% from deep. Just doesn't make sense. Legitimately video game numbers. It looks like like when you do, when you would do the two K Sims and after like three or four years when Luca was winning MVP every year, those were like the numbers he was putting up. It looks like you're playing a, my career mode on two K and you're just playing on rookie mode, trying to get your badges up. That's what it looks like with Luca out there. Like against the uh, nets, it was, he hits a shot to go ahead and close this thing out. It's four straight threes. And it was like, he was just purposefully leveling up the difficulty because he could with the last one being like a, a hook shot, from like being trapped on the sideline. It's he doesn't make any sense. So shout out to Luca. He's been great. Uh last two teams are the Cavaliers and the Hornets. Um Brandon Miller for the Hornets has looked good. I don't know why I'm now deciding to go out of the order that we chose, but Brandon Miller's look <laughs> good for the Hornets so far. I liked a lot of what I've seen from him. I was one of the people that was a big believer in scoot over him in the draft. And it's still very early, but so far Brandon Miller's been better than I was expecting. I knew he was going to be good. It wasn't because I thought Miller was going to be bad. I'm just really high on scoot, but 17.3 points per game, six boards, two dimes shooting nearly 50% from the field. 43% the bench, from deep. Dude, he's not starting. Yeah, exactly. But he's, when he's getting in there, he's taking advantage of his opportunities. He looks poised. He has looked like one of the Hornets best players so far maybe in the argument for their best player up to this point, maybe that I would say probably their most consistent player because LaMelo has been really rough to start the season in terms of efficiency, still playmaking at a high level, but it's coming off. Andrew, I'll come some slack for a little bit. Yeah. He didn't play m- most of last season, but Brandon Miller has been their most consistent player up to this point, which has been awesome to see. i uh, happy to see improving a lot of the doubters wrong and going out there and balling. Just great. Awesome stuff from Brandon Miller. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty much it for them, unless you have anything else to add, and we can wrap up with Cleveland. No, nah, man, I think all we have left is, like, with Cleveland, it's just that we they came in as, like, the clear, like, top four team with Philly, Boston, and Milwaukee, and they just haven't had their complete roster, which is kind of a shame because we really liked their offseason with getting Struess, 
and Niang and some other, you know, depth pieces to go along with, you know, their main guys. But Allen hasn't played a game yet this year. I think Garland's only played one. Mitchell's been on the injury report pretty much every game. So they just need to get healthy. Uh, and another thing that I know you're pretty upset about because he's w- way up there on your agenda is that Evan Mobley, he's had one really good game, but he just really hasn't stepped up with all these guys hurt. And mm. we really thought that offensively he would take that leap at some point, and we just haven't seen that on a consistent basis yet. Yeah, he struggled against the Thunder offensively. He had 14 points, which was fine, but game without Garland or Jared Allen, they probably need more from him. He had 33 against the Pacers, over 50% shooting. He was really good in that one, hit a three, the only one that he's taken so far this season. Against the Knicks tonight, after saying before the game that this is a game that he's had circled on his calendar. You know, the Cavs lost to the Knicks last year, got kind of embarrassed. He and Allen in particular got destroyed on the boards, which was a big reason why the Knicks won. He said he had it circled on his calendar. He was looking forward to it. And then he puts up six points on three of nine shooting. So not really great stuff from Mobley so far. Again, it's early in the season. And I think having Allen and Garland out there will open up the game a lot more for him. He just... I'm still waiting for him to take a bit of a progression offensively, defensively. He's still incredible, but they need more from him offensively to truly have him reach his full potential, get this team to where they need to go. And so far, it doesn't look like that leap is probably coming this season. But yeah. The thing with Mobley is just that everyone's waiting for him to take that all-star leap. And it's not like he's a bad player. Like we're not sitting here slandering Evan Mobley by any means. He's really good. He is really it's good. Just yeah. that I think when you're a top pick in the draft like that, and we know the defense is there and that the offensive skill set is potentially there. Everyone's just like, we're waiting and they just yeah. haven't got it yet. Especially for a team of the cat, like the Cavs who feel like they've got the chance to be one of the best teams in the East, especially, you know, they disappoint last year in the playoffs. They feel like they have a chance to be better but part of that is getting more consistent play offensively from Mobley, which just hasn't come along until this point. But mm-hmm. with that being said, that's all 30 NBA teams. We did the Harden trade. We did that longer episode. We meant to keep it shorter, but an hour, 40 minutes. Uh, we're going to go ahead. You start talking hoops and it just goes. It just good. happens. It happens when you talk all 30 teams. But yeah, let us know what your biggest takeaways were from your team's first week down below in the comments. What are some of your overreactions? Um, next episode, I'm not sure what we're going to do. I think it's going to depend on what happens. Maybe we could do like first couple week awards or something like that. If we want to do something, yeah. if y'all have any ideas for things that you want to see us talk about or any segments, let us know down below and we can go ahead and maybe we'll even just do like a Q and a type thing for an episode, which I think would be good because there's so much going on with the start of the league. Yeah. But yeah leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed, um, go out, check us out on audio platforms as well. Helps us out a ton. We appreciate y'all support up to this point. Going to be coming out with episodes every single week with the NBA season now in full swing. And yeah, if you made it to this point in the episode, drop a, um, drop a Tyrese Maxey for MVP, show some love to Ryan's guy in the comments down below I to let us know it. that you made it to this point. Uh, you got anything you want to wrap up with Ryan? No, nah, man, I got to be to work in five and a half hours. So there I got to go. be up to work in five and a half hours. So I need to head to bed. Yeah, I need to head to bed too. Very little sleep for either one of us last night. So we're going to head to bed. We appreciate y'all tuning in as always. Take care. Enjoy some hoops. Peace. Peace.